They, they lose their ability to think rationally and they lose themselves in the competition, right? Because of greed, because of pride. And so this type of desire that we are creating, that Robert Greene is talking about, it doesn't add to genuine love. It doesn't. But it does. Like a boss. All right, so this strategy of the artist seduction by Robert Greene is a little controversial. And I do not think this is completely necessary, to be honest with you. But there is a principle to be learned when it comes to this to this topic, and that's how to appear like an object of desire. This doesn't just apply to meeting people and finding a partner and increasing their interest towards you. This applies to every aspect of life. This applies to managers, this applies to parents, this applies to teachers, this applies to politics, this applies to your work life. Apply this on how to be an object of desire and get people to compete for you. For example, it's almost like you're an applicant and you're highly desired. If you could communicate to the person who's interviewing you yet yeah, that you're highly desired, your value, no, changing nothing in your resume, your value will increase, right? So let's understand this principle outside of seducing, which is, the, which is a word that's, that's strictly connotated and, and, and associated with deception. No, this is more about overall, how to, how to have that, how to seduce in, in a grand scale, how to bring people to your shop, how to get people to buy things from your company, how to hire people, how to get hired, how to increase your value in, your own, in all your life, okay? So let's watch this, and if you guys enjoy this, um, comment on the, on, the, on the description down below if you're a Patreon supporter, and um, so let's begin with the video. Four, appear to be an object of desire. Create triangles. Let me make let me make sure that sounds good. Okay, good. It's... We are social creatures and are immensely influenced by the tastes and desires of other people. Imagine a large social gathering. You see a man alone whom nobody talks to for any length of time and who is wandering around without company. Isn't there a kind of self-fulfilling isolation about him? Why is he alone? Why is he avoided? There has to be a reason. Until someone takes pity on this man and starts up a conversation with him, he will look unwanted and unwantable. But over there, in another corner, is a woman surrounded by people. They laugh at her remarks, and as they laugh, others join the group, attracted by its gaiety. When she moves around, people follow. Her face is glowing with attention. There has to be a reason. In both cases, of course, there doesn't actually have to be a reason at all. The neglected man may have quite charming qualities, supposing you ever talk to him, but most likely, you won't. Mm -hmm. Desirability is a social illusion. Its source is less what you say or do or any kind of boasting or self-advertisement than the sense that other people desire you. It's it's not about how desirable you really are. It's really about how desirable people think you are. You could create an illusion of fame, an illusion of power, by just get by just creating that illusion. For example, I remember when I was in when I went to Europe, everybody thought I was the weekend or or Juice World, and I'm or or XX, and I'm like, one person actually thought that I was XX. I'm like, yo, dude, he's dead. You know that, right? Like, Tentacion is dead. <laughs> like, people taking pictures with me. And then one time there was this um, when I was in London, this one kid legit thought that I was um, the weekend. He, he he started telling people in the train I was the weekend, and you know it got crazy. When I started getting 45 to 50 year old dudes wanting to take a picture with me, I'm like, dude, do you even, you don't even listen to the weekend. You want to take a picture with me? One time I was reading a book in that train ride and there was someone behind me, but then I saw somebody take a picture and it was a dude hiding in the background trying to take a picture with me. I'm like, and the, and the kid who kept telling everyone that I was the weekend, like two girls gave me their number. I'm like, what? <laughs> 
nothing changed, but the illusion of being a desirable person happened, right? It's called the celebrity effect where you see people walking and people take pictures of them and it creates the illusion that they're desirable, right? This, we are susceptible to this. Just like we're susceptible to people looking up and then we look up. We are social animals, right? And we all, and we only need one person whom we are influenced by to promote that thing in order to become, desi to become desirable, even if the quality doesn't change. So that's why a lot of marketing teams, they'll hire desirable women or, or they'll hire celebrities to get that credibility, right? To get them, if somebody of that high value likes them, then that means if they like them, and I'm trying to be like them, I'm gonna like, like them too. It's like the guy who has a hot girlfriend, and all of a sudden all the girls want him now. It's because he was chosen by her, and now other women want him, all cause a, a high status woman, or the illusion that a high status woman likes him, even though they may not be together, but if you just post pictures where you're around high value women, attractive women, you look more attractive as a man, even if they're models that you hired, right? So it's not about reality, it's about the illusion of it. Studies show that if a man, if you take a picture with women smiling at a man, he looks more attractive. Same picture, same people, but now the, the people are smiling directly at the camera, they look, the men look less attractive. Nothing changed physically with the guy, but the illusion of, 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 of being an object of desire. To turn your target's interest into something deeper, into desire, you must make them see you as a person whom others cherish and covet. Desire is both imitative, we like what others like, and competitive, we want to take away from others what they have. You see, a lot of mar marketers understand that it's one thing for there to be a sale but when people start competing for that thing, they get very they they they, they get very tribal. They be, they become very primal. People start. Have you seen videos of people during um during Black Friday? Like I've seen videos of 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 adults taking toys from children. I'm like this this is his first Black Friday, and here you are, I'm, I'm, I'm Bob the Bob the dude taking the the, the toy from the baby. It's crazy. You see so many of them. By the way, if you guys are enjoying this video, become a Patreon supporter for just five dollars a month. You guys will get access to my Robert Green Book Club, and for ten dollars a month, and a bunch of other videos that I post. And for ten dollars a month, you get the audio version of the Robert Green Book Club and the videos. And then for twenty-five dollars a month, you get all of those um, perks plus. You guys get to watch, um, get to ask one question per month, and I'll make a video about it. Let's get back to the video. They, they lose their ability to think rationally and they lose themselves in the competition, right? Because of greed, because of pride. And so this type of desire that we are creating, that Robert Green is talking about, it doesn't add to genuine love. It doesn't. But it does create the illusion of desire in order to give the person time to develop a love for you. But if there's no potential from this person to love you, and you do this, you're only get a, gonna get a temporary result. Almost like going to a, almost like going to a to a motivational weekend and leaving feeling motivated, but then it fades away. It's the same thing. As children, we wanted to monopolize the attention of a parent to draw it away from other siblings. This sense of rivalry pervades human desire, repeating throughout our lives. Make people compete for your attention. Make them see you as sought after by everyone else. Mm -hmm. The aura of desirability will envelop you. It's an aura, but that's what it is. It's when you think about it as an aura. It, it, it's like it, it's it's like when um, Charlie Murphy from the Chappelle Show, when he said he saw Prince. I mean, when he said he saw, um, not Prince, Rick James, he said that he literally saw an aura, right? But, but what's an aura? An aura is our emotions clouding a perception of someone. It's almost like our emotion. You know how when you say you feel sad and so everything looks dark and gloomy, even though there might be colors, but everything looks dark and gloomy. So your emotions 
is superimposing on what you see because your eyes have neurons to tell your brain what to see. So you might be seeing a beautiful scenery, but through the eyes of your emotions, you're seeing an aura of gloominess and sadness, like when you have a bad day. So your brain might be might be get, might be seeing the, the 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 beautiful colors, but it's not perceiving it. It's not pro fully processing it. There's a fog of emotion, almost like a fog, and 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 uh, almost like a like a foggy window, and not being able to see the the, the, the through the rain. Right, that's almost like an aura, but for the negative. The positive aura is when this person produces certain positive emotions that we are seeing this person through an extreme bias. And the more of an aura they have, the more of a bias our perception of them are. And this is where the halo effect is in, where this aura of desir desirability will increase how attractive they are. You might even start noticing more symmetric parts of their face. You might be focusing more on the, the, the parts that are symmetric and, and, and avoiding or even avoiding recognizing the, the, asymmetry, the parts that are asymmetric, right, per se. I think, that, I think the brain has that bias when we like someone. We just ignore the negative. And so our visual, our ability to see this person will almost like distort itself, like gravity distorts light. And you only see the positive and the negative. And it's almost like you're not getting the full signal because of the, of the, of the aura. Like this aura has an influence on you. And this aura could be called charisma. Um, and that's why when you create this aura, you could do no wrong. When you put, make people compete for you, you could do no wrong. Um, that's what cult leaders use, a lot of celebrities use, and a lot of abusive partners do to a lot of people. And also, when you fall in love, this happens. You start seeing this aura. And this aura begin, gets magnified when there's competition because we begin to get very primal and our ego and our self-esteem gets wrapped up in our winning. All right, let's keep listening. Your admirers can be friends or even suitors. Call it the harem effect. Pauline Bonaparte, sister of Napoleon, raised her value in men's eyes by always having a group of worshipful men around her at balls and parties. If she went for a you see, it's not just about, you don't have to bank the whole football team like I always say. Just have friends. Even I, That's why I tell guys, look guys, to men, have female friends, man. One, if you don't know how to keep female friends, then there's something wrong with you. You're doing, you are, you are, un, you are not self-aware, honestly. You got to learn how to keep, have female friends. And also, female friends come with a lot of positives. One, they give you constructive criticism. Two, it's, 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 it's good to have, it's healthy for a man to have female friends. It just is, right? Um, and three, it's also, it comes with social points, right? They know they have friends, they can introduce you to people, right? Um, and also you're signaling to people that you're not a, that you're not a threat. It, it comes with a lot of positives having female friends. Like, unless you date a super controlling woman, then she's gonna wanna remove all your female friends. But there's a lot of positives to that. And, and there's, a, there's a positive indication of, of a man who could keep female friends and vice versa with a woman, right? By you having male friends, like I always say, having friends of the opposite sex always puts the other partner in a, in a sexually competitive state. It always does. It is what it is. A walk, it was never with one man, always with two or three. Perhaps these men were simply friends or even just props and hangers on. The sight of them was enough to suggest that she was prized and desired, a woman worth fighting over. Andy Warhol, too, surrounded himself with the most glamorous, interesting people he could find. To be part of his inner circle meant that you were desirable as well. By placing himself in the middle but keeping himself aloof from it all, he made everyone compete for his attention. Mm -hmm. He stirred people's desire to possess him by holding back. Practices like these not only stimulate competitive desires, they take aim at people's prime weakness, their vanity and self-esteem. We can endure feeling that another person has more talent or more money, but the sense that a rival is more desirable than we are, that is unbearable. In the early 18th century, the Duke de Richelieu, a great rake, managed to seduce a young woman who was rather religious but whose husband, adult, was often away. He then proceeded to seduce her upstairs neighbor, 
a young widow. When the two women discovered that he was going from one to the other in the same night, they confronted him. A lesser man would have fled, but not the Duke. He understood the dynamic of vanity and desire. Neither woman wanted to feel that he preferred the other. And so he managed to arrange a little menage a trois, <laughs> knowing that now they would struggle between themselves to be the favorite. Yeah, this this is honestly like, it's so insidious, but it, it, it there is so much truth um, to that. It's just an uncomfortable truth. Um, and I, I, I want to view this outside of the perspective of sexual relations because it looks... Under those lights, it looks manipulative. But when we look at it from an organizational perspective, or maybe a business or parenting, I, I don't. My parenting is not that good because this happens a lot with parents, and a lot of parents will tell you that their kids fight for their attention. Um, and you see this dynamic, and a lot of the times the kids end up not liking their siblings, and and they end up fighting a lot, all because they're fighting for their for their for the parents' attention. Um, and <laughs> I remember this happened to me one time, man, where <laughs> this, was, this was during the evil days, people. So please don't judge me, okay? This was during the evil days. Um, that was like many years ago. So anyway, so I made a date with a girl. And I was like, hey, let's meet up. And we met up. And I thought I met the girl. But then I got a text from another girl. She was like, hey, I'm at the bar you told me to be at. And I'm like, what? And she was like, yeah, I'm at the bar. I'm like... Oh my God, I invited, I invited two girls without even knowing it. People, I'm forgetful. That sometimes happens. No, no, <laughs> that sometimes happens. <laughs> but that, I forget things sometimes. Not that that happens. That was, that was really rude of me, to be honest, because I, I, I was so sad. I, I was, anyways. So, the, so I told the girl that I was with on the day, I was like, look, oh, you beautiful Egyptian girl. Um, I have a little dilemma right now. She was like, what is it? I was like, look, man, I, I don't know how this happened, but I invited you on a date today. And for some reason, I invited another girl by mistake. And I swear to God, people, it was by mistake. It was really by mistake. Anyways, so I was like, I'm, it, I, I don't know what to do. And she was like, well, invite her. I don't mind. I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I swear to God, people, I, I saw an aura. I saw an aura in her head, people. I, I, I saw an angel. I saw wings on her, people. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. I'm like, so I texted the girl. And I was like, hey, um, I think we have a problem. And I was like, look. And she came over. And she came from fucking Spain, and I was in the Netherlands. Don't ask me. No, don't ask questions, people. She was like, hey, man, what the fuck? And I was like, ah, look, man, I don't know what happened. Um, I invited you. You both look the same. I swear to God, they looked the same and they had a similar name. And, and I was like, look, man, um, what should we do? And she was like, anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, you could join the Robert Green Book Club to watch the whole video. For five dollars a month, you guys have access to all of my Robert Green uh, book club videos. For ten dollars a month, you get access to them, and we're gonna start adding. For ten dollars a month, you get you get the podcast version <coughs> of um, the videos of the of Robert Green videos. So that means you guys can watch it in audio form through a podcast feed, so that you you don't have to watch the video. And for twenty five dollars a month, you get all of those perks. Plus, you guys can. Um, um, what you would call it? You guys can ask one question per month, and I'll make a video about it. And <clears throat> for fifty dollars a month, sorry, oh my God, fellow Alex is dying. <clears throat> and for fifty dollars a month, you guys can get all of those perks, and I'll draw you, and I'll send you the drawing in a form of um, through email. Okay. Anyways, I'll see you guys there. Support the Patreon and join the book club.